destroyed in mined premises, broken shop windows, empty exhibition halls and storage facilities. Russians looted here as best they could. They took everything. Everything is broken. During the occupation, the Russian military took almost all cultural values from the Kherson museums. Silver, coining, icons, which are of great value. The scale of robbery of unique Ukrainian exhibits is the largest since the Second World War. The trucks were loaded one after another. What's behind Russian looting and vandalism? And why does Russia need Ukrainian cultural heritage? See the special report Cultural Genocide in the Occupied Territories. Eight months in occupation, Kherson, captured in the first days of the full-scale invasion, was through the pseudo-referendum and pseudo-unification with Russia, became a real witness to violations of international law and war crimes of the Russian army. After the liberation of the city, it became obvious to Ukraine and the whole world that Russia had plundered and, under the pretext of evacuation, took almost all Ukrainian artifacts and historical values from museums. 15,000 unique pieces of art have been stolen. This is the largest theft of cultural property since World War II. The museums were completely robbed. There were objects that deflected the way of life, the life of the ancient Scythians. The most valuable thing here was the Scythian gold jewelry. It is also stolen. Russians looted here as best they could. They took everything. Everything is broken. Kherson Local Law Museum is the oldest museum in the south of Ukraine. Its collection has been formed since the 19th century. Artifacts of the Scythian and ancient Greek periods, the Cossacks and the Russian Empire were kept within these walls. Now the halls of the museum are empty. They took the gold, the collection of icons from the pond. They took out all the weapons that we had, starting from ancient times and ending with modern weapons, awards, medals. It's like someone broke into your own house and robbed. Now Olena is perhaps the only museum worker who has remained at her workplace. The rest either left from the first days of the war or escaped with the Russians. The heading part of the museum team took to the side of the invaders. They filmed in propaganda stories, repeating Kremlin narratives and organized exhibitions ordered by the occupiers. Those who did not support the occupiers were fired. They expected that the museum would work at full. They would cooperate with Russian museums. Money were promised to them here. And it didn't work out the way they wanted. From them, I think, this was also a shock. For three days, the Russian military carried everything they could out of here. Sculptures and stone stelaes remained. They were too heavy. The same with the cannon. They could only drag it to the next room. What exactly was needed to be stolen, the invaders knew in advance. By the invitation of former museum director, who is a collaborator, representatives of the Crimean Museum had arrived. She showed them everything. She was like a hospitable hostess. They looked where everything was. They probably already came with the goal that they would take it all away next time. The exact number of stolen exhibits is still unknown yet. Now the museum staff is compiling lists. This will take maybe a year or more. As of January 1, 2022, 180,000 exhibits were stored in our museum, and now it all needs to be rechecked. The whole list of stolen goods has already been compiled in the art museum. The works of Ivazovsky, Vrubel, 
Konchalowski are stolen. Only the names on the labels of empty frames remained. The museum's collection included works of art from the 17th to 20th centuries. They were masterpieces of French, German, Italian artists. Of more than 13,000 exhibits, 80% were stolen. Only modern works by local artists and what the occupiers simply could not carry away remained. I was so pleased to show all this to people. I visited the depository with such trepidation that we have it. And we could show this to people by changing sometimes the exposure. What we can show now? The museum is located in the building of the former city hall. At the end of 2021, it was closed for restoration. All exhibits were packed and taken to the storage facility. All the documents were hidden in the safes. There were already boxes with stock documents and we put a vacuum cleaner on top. More boxes of cards were already damaged. In general, it was laid to the top. Our available exhibits were located exactly there. Perhaps it would be possible to hide the exhibits until the liberation of Kherson, if not for one of the former employees of the museum. On her tip, representatives of the FSB had come. As it turned out later, she also helped the Russians to restore the remote electronic database. I was told, as for the first time in May, we are people with weapons. You don't understand who you are talking to. If you don't want to do it, everything will be broken here and you will be taken to the commandant's office. They took all our phones and searched the office. In one moment, I told that everything has already been taken out. Nobody believed me. They took my things and took me home in a car with a search. Held at her house, searches yield no results. All personal documents were taken away from Anna, and on November the 1st, they were summoned to the museum. She stayed there for the next two days. She was forbidden to leave until the Russians removed the whole collection from the museum. Anna's task was to draw up acts of transfer without a specific destination. At least I knew that I would see the numbers of stolen exhibitions, how global it would be. There were 30-40 people chasing the cultural and historical artifacts. One after another, trucks were loaded. The only thing that I was told was that they were the authorized representative of the Minister of Culture of the Russian Federation. And that's all. The invaders transported the loot from the two museums to the Crimea. Pictures from the art museum have already been in Simferopol. Some of them were identified from photos in social networks. Ordinary theft was called as an evacuation, hiding behind the result of an illegal referendum. Kherson was under occupation of the Russian Federation for 41 days. This time was enough to steal and call out treasures as the Russian property. On these empty pedestals stood monuments of Suvorov and Potemkin. The Russians even took the remains of Potemkin with them. Such practice already existed in the last years of the existence of the Russian Empire. Then the clergy before the onset of the enemy evacuated the bones, but not people. Potemkin is called one of Putin's idols. Most recently, the Russian dictator mentioned his name in a pseudo-historical speech. The Kremlin does not get tired of repeating myths about the historical unity of Ukraine and Russians. The memory of the conqueror of Ukrainian lands, Commander Potemkin, is alive for those who want to recreate the Russian Empire. But at the same time, right now, Russian troops are destroying precisely those cities that Potemkin founded. The damage to museums is in the millions of dollars. The precise amount will become clear after compiling a list of stolen goods and reconciliations with artifact registries. As history shows, stealing valuables and everything that is possible to steal is a hallmark of a Russian soldier.
However, it is not only soldiers who steal in Russia. A golden comb, presumably from the 4th century BC, it is decorated with four figures of lion lions over which warriors are fighting. This decoration is the pride and symbol of the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg. The comb was also stolen and illegally exported from Ukraine. It was discovered in 1913 during excavations of the Soloha Barrow in Zaporizhia region. In the imperial period, it was absolutely normal. If it was financed by the Imperial Archaeological Commission, there was such an institute, then, as a rule, all this went to St. Petersburg, to Hermitage. They had priority in selecting finds. As a matter of fact, they could insist that these finds, therefore, go without fail to the Hermitage, to the historical museum in Moscow. They not only took out all the most valuable but also hid the origin of the relics. This practice following the Russian Empire was adopted by the Soviet Union. These are thousands of valuables whose history has been rewritten in Russian museums. With special zeal, the Kremlin hunted for the gold of the Scythians. A masterpiece of jewelry craftsmanship, the golden pectoral was found under the mound of Tovsta grave in the Dnipropetrovsk region. And they could not take it to Moscow, because by that time in Ukraine there already existed an institution for an artifact, the Museum of Historical Treasures. And after the restoration of the pectoral in Moscow, the CDN decoration had to be returned to Kyiv. Such things are stored in museum collections and there must be an institution that provides this mode of storage. We had such an institution and there was no question that we could not provide proper conditions and security. A new round for Tsidian Guild began in February 2014. Exhibits from six Ukrainian museums, Kyiv, Odessa and Crimea, were brought to the exhibition at the Elad Pearson Archaeological Museum in Amsterdam. At the same time, the Russian army invaded the Ukrainian Crimea and annexed the peninsula. Russians tried to appropriate the Tsidian Guild, like the Crimean museums are autonomous and are not subordinate to the Ukrainian Ministry of Culture. On this basis, they demanded the return of the collections to the Crimea. They used the status of the Crimean museums, some were national, some were regional. According to them, those are completely different subjects and the Ministry of Culture and the State of Ukraine have nothing to do with them. We said that all this is the property of the State of Ukraine. After seven years of litigation, the Netherlands Court of Appeal decided that exhibits should be returned to Ukraine, as Ukrainian law says. Now the case is being considered by the Court of Cassation. Lawyers want to ensure that the decision is made not on the basis of national laws, but on the basis of the UNESCO Convention. This is indeed such a first sign on the basis of which all subsequent claims will be made, since in Europe case law and one court decision entails similar decisions in other cases. But here it should be noted that the Russian Federation, although it is a party to many conventions, doesn't comply with these conventions. They passed their national law, which states that everything they have belongs to Russia and will never be returned to anyone. Indeed, without these exhibits, eminent Russian museums will simply become empty. For hundreds of years, their funds were replenished only with stolen artifacts. The Russians brought them from the occupied territories, mostly from Ukraine. In 1918, the Red Army, led by Mikhail Muravyov, planted Kyiv for several weeks. His work was continued by Soviet officials. In 1934, unique frescoes and mosaics of Dimitrius of Thessalonica of the 12th century were taken out. That's how the theft of artifacts was justified. The indicated monuments are of tremendous importance for the exposition of the State Tretyakov Gallery, in which the art of Kiev Rus is represented very poorly, despite the significant importance that it has in the overall development of Russian art. From a letter from the head of the museum department of the People's Commissariat of Education of the Russian Federated Socialist Republic, Felix Koch, to the People's Commissar of the Education of the Ukrainian SSR, Vladimir Zatonsky. 
That is, Russian officials said, since there is almost nothing of old Rus in Moscow, then Kiev is obliged to give up its relics in the name of Russian art. Resistance under the conditions of Stalin's repressions was useless. The Russians took the artifacts to a temporary exhibition. With supreme efforts, only a part of the frescoes was returned to Kuyu. The mosaic of Dmitry Solunsky is still in the Tretyakov Gallery. A new wave of robberies took place during the World War II. The fascist invaders and the Soviet army stole Ukrainian cultural values, so to speak, with great pleasure. The Soviets took out the exhibits under the pretext of evacuation. Wehrmacht soldiers took exhibits of almost 200 Ukrainian museums during the retreat. After the fall of the Hitler regime, Germany returned the stolen goods, but not to museums, but to states. So tens of millions of exhibits appeared in Moscow. There were several returns from the time of Ukraine's independence. In 2002, the altar cross of the Holy Transfiguration Cathedral, which is located in Odessa, returned by Russia, and fragments of the frescoes of St. Michaelo Golden Dawn Cathedral. There was also the return of the frescoes from Germany to the Soviet Union. But in a strange way, they ended up not in Kyiv, as it should have been, but in the Hermitage in St. Petersburg. And already in 2001, they were transferred to Ukraine. During independence, a little more than 150,000 stolen exhibits were returned to museums. This is but a drop in the ocean. Already after the World War II, Russia exported cultural values from Ukraine by echelons. Russian archaeologists who worked at the excavations took the most valuable finds for exhibitions or research. These collections were taken to certain institutions outside Ukraine. That is, the rule works so that for five years the collection may not be in a museum institution, not in permanent storage, but in temporary storage for processing, and these five years turned to 10, 20 or even 50 years. Historical values from the colonies and occupied countries were exported by armies of the world. But the main goal of Russia is not material enrichment, but the destruction of Ukrainian identity. Only in this way could Moscow, funded by the Prince of Kyiv, attribute a foreign history and several hundred years of statehood, erase Ukrainian original history and present our state as a colony of Russia. Russians are fighting against our identity, which is our cultural heritage, and the fact that they rob museums absolutely fits into the logic of the war against our values, our heritage. They not only rob, but in some places they destroy museums completely. In Ivankiv, the Kyiv region, where a museums were destroyed, where Primachenko's collections were kept, paintings were saved. This is an example of a conscious attitude, and in Skovorodinovka, Kharkiv region, the museum was bombed. The museum workers managed to hide the most valuable things. A Russian missile hit the museum in one place from hailstones, and in another place from an airplane. That is, this is a war against our cultural code and against our values, and it is the story of robberies that is a part of such a policy. It was impossible to save Ukrainian museums from looting. The Minister of Culture and Information Policy of Ukraine says there was no mechanism for preventive evacuation from potentially unsafe regions in Ukraine. And after the full-scale Russian invasion, there was not enough time for this. After all, the Russians occupied Kherson in the first days. <laughs> Despite the general resistance to the occupation of the inhabitants of the Kherson region, there were those who decided to help Russians. It made the evacuation of the exhibits impossible. We have examples when even the occupied territories, for example in Izum, the local museum workers managed together with local colleagues to hide the funds of Izum Museum of Local Lore. In Kherson it was particularly impossible to do this. All the museum workers who collaborated with the Russians knew what they actually wanted to take out, and the robbery process began a week before after Kherson was liberated by Ukrainian troops.
the Slovensk Museum is one of the successful examples of evacuation. Its collection includes more than 30,000 items. The museum workers were provided with everything necessary, packing materials and transport were by the cost of public organizations. When the collection was taken away, museum workers do not say, for the safety of exhibits. The Ukrainian Ministry of Culture says that a lot of museums were saved from looting. The losses of museum collections during the full-scale invasion have only just begun to be counted. Stolen seething gold from the Melitopol Museum, paintings by Kuinji and Ivazovsky taken from Mariupol, unique exhibits from Kherson, dozens of plundered museums in Donetsk, Luhansk regions and Crimea for more than eight years of occupation. Experts say that digitalization of archives would help speed up the calculations of losses. The priority actions that the state should take is to digitize all archives as soon as possible, including compiling lists of these cultural values that are in museums in the occupied territories, in the free territories, in order to better control and regulate these processes. Russian military took valuables from the museums of all the cities they occupied. In addition to Kherson, the richest collections of the art and local history museums of Mariupol and Melitopol were stolen. In total, about 40 Ukrainian museums were looted. The occupying authorities of Crimea are already preparing to export exhibits from the museums of the illegally annexed peninsula to Russia. Is it possible to return the stolen Ukrainian museum valuables? And what mechanism will have to be used? used. It will be possible for Ukraine to return what was stolen by Russia in the process of restitution. The mechanism was applied in particular after the World War II, when Germany returned valuable stolen by the Nazis to their rightful owners. After the victory of Ukraine over Russia, this procedure will become possible again. The Ministry of Culture is already preparing a list of stolen valuables. This is the hard work. It is not just to look, to take pictures. We should assess the damage that Russia caused and we provided this information to UNESCO in order to prevent the illegal traffic of cultural property. After all, it is difficult to predict where the stolen Ukrainian artifacts will be. If they just transported a certain museum with a collection to another city, then I think that they also make lists of what they steal in order to establish it later. If this is a banal robbery, for example, with soldiers who stuffed something under their clothes and stole something, then the exhibit may even end up abroad. It may also be found somewhere at auctions after a certain time in private collections of Russians. It will be more difficult to find them at times. Values stolen by the Nazis, which were considered lost forever, are found in private collections decades later. They appear when some heir decided to exhibit this or that painting or even give it to someone. And it turns out that this is not a private property at all, but stolen. And all this was taken out. I think that this process is very active today in the Russian Federation. For such disappeared artifacts, Russia will have to pay billions in compensation and pass to Ukraine equivalent relics from their museums. The case of the return of all stolen valuables to Ukraine may take more than one year, and it will definitely require the intervention of international organizations and court decisions. After all, Russians are unlikely to agree to voluntarily return the loot. Museum exhibits stolen in Ukraine are used for the needs of the Kremlin, namely rewriting their own history and as a means of creating the image of a great culturally developed state since ancient times times. If in Russia it succeeds, then for the whole world it is as a nation of marauders which not having its own heritage and culture cynically appropriates others. Reported by Dana Kolesnik, Daria Litovchenko, Ksenia Barvinenko.